Let's take our hymnals, turn to hymn number 433. 433, tell it to Jesus, 433. And let's stand once again as we sing hymn number 433. Junior Church, you may be dismissed. Welcome each other this evening.
you had a wonderful afternoon in the Lord and looking forward to a great missions conference by his grace. I have really enjoyed uh, getting to meet and know a little bit the Nymans today and excited about their ministry. And also it was great to break bread with uh, uh, Drew. Uh, they've gone out, I won't say, uh, and his sister uh, at lunch today. We had a great time, at least I enjoyed it with them, and of course the pastor and his family as well. So it's been a great day. I thank your pastor for the invite to come and I'm looking forward to the Fruins being here uh, Monday through Wednesday. Dear friends with Baptist World, we're very excited about what the Lord's doing in their life. Let's take our Bibles and go tonight to Acts chapter 2, if you would, please. We're looking tonight at the theme of this text that we're considering. I've entitled it, The Message of Winged Feet. And I want to introduce it with a true story. Some of you will know of whom I'm speaking, but... uh, The idea of this story is related to the fact that confusion always leads to misdirected action. Confusion always leads to misdirected actions. It was the 1930s. J. Edgar Hoover was the uh, leader of the CIA, our government's uh, spy agency, and uh, he was... uh, uh, quite an eccentric individual. If any of you have read his biography, know anything about him, he was an unusual character. And he had a lot of things that he just really, you know, was a very much a stickler about. One of the things was he did not like his secretary to go too, over, too far over in the margins on the letters that she typed for him. So he would dictate the letter and the secretary was, would type it. Well, he got a new secretary. And he explained to her what he wanted, but sure the day came when he dictated a letter and she typed and went way over in the margins and he was really upset. So he got a felt tip pen and he wrote across the letter she had typed, retype and watch the borders. Well, she was confused by that. So she retyped the letter and she sent out to all the agents on the Canadian and Mexican border in bold letters, watch the borders. True story. Confusion misdirects our actions. And that is certainly true relating to the gospel. You see, we, as we heard this morning, are to have winged feet. We're to go urgently with the message, but if we don't know what the message is, it will only result in confusion. You remember the Old Testament story of David at the death of Absalom? How there was a young man that wanted to run and tell the story of Joab's death, uh, and he was granted to do that, but there was another young man who wanted to go and tell the news, but he didn't know what the news was. And so he kept saying... Uh, to uh, the Absalom's death, he kept saying to Joab, let me run, let me run. And Joab finally said, okay, run. And the guy took off running. He didn't know what the news was, but he outran the man who had the news. He had winged feet. And we can have a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of zeal for the Lord and even for the gospel. 
But if we do not know what the gospel is, or if we're weak in understanding the gospel, it will misdirect our actions relating to the souls of men. So what we want to do tonight is go back to Acts chapter 2, and we want to take a look at the gospel. Now, it's very important to understand that the book of Acts is the first volume of church history. It covers a period of time from Pentecost until near the end of the Apostle Paul's life, about 30 years. If we did not have the book of Acts, if, if we didn't have, and I forgot to turn this on, okay, I think I'm on now, great. If we did not have the book of Acts, we would go from the end of four gospel records, and each of those gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, would end with 120 people in the upper room waiting for the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit, really not fully understanding what that was all about. If we did not have the book of Acts, we would turn the last page of John's gospel 120 people, 120 Christians in Jerusalem in the upper room, and the next page in our Bible would say, Paul the Apostle to the church at Rome. And we would ask the question, who is this guy Paul, and how did the gospel get all the way from a group of 120 somewhat fearful in the upper room to a great church in the capital of the empire? We wouldn't know unless we had the book of Acts. Now, we need to understand as we come to the book of Acts tonight that there are things in the book of Acts that are not for today. It's a transitional book, but there are also things that are for today. For example, uh, something that I believe that is not for today, uh, and I'll illustrate it in asking your pastor a couple of questions. Pastor, in the book of Acts, when Peter walked down the street there were people that were sick, and his shadow falling across them caused them to be healed. Pastor, have you ever had anyone healed by your shadow falling across them? They get sick, okay. <laughs> nobody, nobody recently? Nobody ever, right? Okay. So now your pastor's a good guy. But there were things that applied to the apostles such as the miraculous healings of Peter's shadow, uh, tongues and other things in the book of Acts that were for the time of the apostles that really was concluded with the completion of the book of Revelation around 90 A.D. Those things are not for today. But in the book of Acts, there are things that are for today. For example, the number one evidence of being filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts is not speaking with tongues. You check it out. As a matter of fact, the number one evidence of being filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts, it says it over and over again, they spake the word with boldness. It is the bold proclamation of the gospel. And we have the same Spirit of God today that wants us to have a bold proclamation of the gospel. He wants us to have winged feet. But if we don't know what the message is, we may get there with swift feet, but if we don't know what the message is, there will be confusion about our delivering that. So what we want to do tonight is go to the book of Acts chapter 2, and we want to talk about two Greek words that really describe for us both the force of the gospel and the focus of the gospel. And in doing this, and in looking at Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, we will discover what the message is that we're to deliver. So let's begin reading Acts chapter 2, verse 14, uh, and then verse 22, and we're going to see Peter doing something here, and then I'll set the context. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, verse 14 of Acts 2, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. So Peter is lifting up his voice, he is proclaiming something, and he is calling upon the people to take action upon his message. Look at verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, the implication, hear and take action on. What is Peter doing? Peter is preaching. Now the word preach is not used here, but in the New Testament it is used in many occasions to describe what Peter is doing here. And there are two primary words, there are some others, but two primary words in the Greek language for preaching. One of those is the word keruso. 
And it really deals with the force of our preaching or how we preach. And the other one is the word kerugma, which is translated preach, and it deals with the content. So when we come to this matter of preaching the gospel, we need to understand that we not only need to get the way we preach right, but we need to get the content of our preaching right as well. You know, I grew up in Tennessee, and I heard about a preacher there who wrote in the margin of his Bible, weak point, yell loud. That is not the way to preach, okay? You don't want to have a weak point to begin with. So, we're going to look at this tonight. So, what's the context of Acts chapter 2? 120 in the upper room, they've been waiting for the coming of the Spirit uh, as promised by Christ. And verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, what is this day of Pentecost? It is 50 days after the Passover. It is a great Jewish festival. According to Josephus, a Jewish historian of the time of Christ and and the decades following, there would have been up to a million people gathering at this time in the city of Jerusalem for the great feast of Pentecost. The disciples were gathered on the southwest side of the city of Jerusalem in what we know as the city of David or Zion. They would have been meeting in an upper room and that room would have been situated on the high place of the city of David. Just down the hill from the city of David, you have the southern steps going up into the temple complex. So here was a room nearby the southern entrance to the temple probably with open windows, as was the custom in that day. And the people, by the thousands, even up to a million, are coming up into the temple to worship Jehovah God as Jewish people. And suddenly, it were as the sound of rushing mighty wind on that upper room where the 120 are gathered. And there are cloven tongues of fire that appear. And they begin to preach the gospel. And people by the thousands hear and they see this phenomena and they gather around the upper room. Some people say, what are these people doing, the apostles? Uh, Are they drunk? And no, it's too early in the day for anybody to be drinking. There's a lot of reasoning. There's a lot of Jewish animation going on. And so Peter stands up and he preaches the gospel. And in preaching the gospel that day, 3,000 people get saved and the church is born. And what we find here in this passage, we find the first preaching of the gospel after the resurrection of Christ. And what Peter preaches in this passage is exactly what Paul articulates in 1 Corinthians 15. Now why is this important? Because I think there are two things that we're missing today in some parts of American fundamentalism among our independent Baptist brethren. We're missing at times the force of the preaching. We've become to a degree a nation that doesn't like authoritative messages, and so we're kind of downgrading it into what was called a number of years ago with the Russians, detente or just discussion. We're missing the force of the message. But also, it's easy for us to miss the focus of the message, and we fail to give an incomplete gospel. You know, sometimes people say to me, well, you know, Pastor, I've been preaching the gospel to my friend. I say, well, tell me about it. They say, well, I invited them to church. I say, that's wonderful. It's good for you to invite them to church. But inviting someone to church is not preaching the gospel to them. Or they say, well, I told them what a great pastor we have over here at Heritage, and uh, I'm sharing the gospel with them. No, it's good to tell them you have a great pastor at your church, but that's not the same as sharing the gospel with them. So what is the gospel? So tonight, the force and the focus. So we begin in verse 14, the force of the message, which is the priority of preaching. So Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, And he said, ye men of Judea, be it known unto you and hearken to my words. He is proclaiming as a herald a message. And he is calling people to action on that message. That is a biblical definition of the Greek word keruso, which is used throughout the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts, which means to proclaim as a herald, the priority of preaching. 
Did you know the first activity in the birthing of the church was a gospel message? Where did they get it from? They got it from our Lord. As I mentioned this morning, the number one activity of our Savior was going around preaching the gospel. Now for Christ, he was preaching his future coming death, burial, and resurrection. Now for us, we have that completed message, and Peter does. And so there is a bold declaration. It was the work of the apostles to preach. Study the book of Acts. It says over and over again, and they preached, and they preached, and they preached. The number one activity of Paul and Barnabas as the first missionaries in Acts 13, they went preaching the gospel. So we see here the priority of preaching. And that has been true not only in the New Testament times, but down through church history. Coming forward to what we might call modern church history, the Reformation was initiated and spread largely through the priority of preaching. Now, let me say that I am not a Reformed Baptist, okay? I am an independent Baptist. I do not hold to Reformed theology. Uh, but I am thankful that there were men in the Reformation who boldly preached the gospel. For example, Martin Luther, who was not a Baptist, he is now, you understand, because he's in heaven, but he wasn't at the time. He founded the Lutheran Church. Someone said to Martin Luther, why do you preach the way you preach? And Luther said, I, this is from his biography, I preach like Christ died on the cross yesterday for my sins, like he was buried and rose again from the dead today, and like he's coming back to the earth tomorrow. That's how I preach. Folks, Martin Luther did not shake Germany for Christ because he brought the baggage of Reformed theology with him. He shook it through the gospel. And the gospel of the reformers such as Calvin and Zwingli and Knox, they shook nations through simply preaching the gospel. God used them in a great way. Then the 17th century Puritanism, you know the story of, of how the dissenters in England to the Church of England became known as the Puritans. Uh, they were staying in to purify the Anglican Church, but they began to be persecuted. They fled to Holland and eventually to America. And in those backwater alleys of Holland, they had churches, and they preached the gospel with great power. And even the founding of our nation is rooted in the preaching of the Puritans. What about the Great Awakening of the 18th century under George Whitfield, John Wesley, and Jonathan Edwards? What about the 19th century evangelist D.L. Moody and great preachers like Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Joseph Parker, and Alexander McLaren? God has always honored preaching of the gospel, proclaiming as a herald. And even the architecture of your building reveals the priority of preaching. When you come into this building, what do you see in the center of this room? You see a pulpit, a lectern for the preaching of the gospel. Now, if you had been around in 1500 uh, at the uh, time that really the Reformation was beginning, you would have seen something very radical if you had gone into a Catholic church. From the year 500 until 1500, what Luther called the devil's millennium, the thousand years of the dark ages when Catholicism held Europe in the bondage of illiteracy and, and no gospel, what you would have seen in a Roman Catholic church when you came in was the altar for mass. There would have been no pulpit because there really was no preaching. If there was any kind of a lectern, it was a small one over on the side. When the Reformation took place, gradually the lectern moved from the side to the center. And today, when you come into an independent Baptist church, you find that the pulpit is central because preaching is God's priority and churches that are biblical understand that. And they build their buildings to reflect that. Tragically, if you go into a modern contemporary church Christian church in the United States, you will not see a pulpit, you will see a stage. Because entertainment has replaced preaching as the focus of contemporary Christianity in America. And so what I submit to you is what we're doing here, what you're doing here, is biblical. It is the priority of preaching. It is what God has ordained. It is the caruso to proclaim as a herald. So let's talk about this force of preaching. 
this word keruso. It literally means, as I just said, to proclaim as a herald. So when a person was going to go out as a herald for the king, as a preacher for the king, the king would make a decree and he would write it on a scroll and he would go out into the marketplace and he would unroll the scroll in the center of town and he would cry with a loud voice, Thus saith the king. It was a message of authority calling on the people to action based on the king's command. What the herald, the preacher, did not do for the king, he didn't go out and say, you know, folks, listen, uh, I know you're all busy, and uh, the king really would appreciate it if somehow you can work it into your schedule to somehow do what he would like for you to do. If not, that's okay, but the king would really like for you to do this. That was not what the herald did. The herald went into the market and said, Thus saith the king. It was a message of authority. And that is the word from which we get our word preaching. Now, you say, well, then preaching means that you yell loud, right? No, that's not what preaching is. As a matter of fact, I'll illustrate it. Uh, up near where I'm staying, across the street, is a McDonald's. If I were to go tomorrow morning over to McDonald's to meet someone for breakfast and they were unsaved and I was going to preach the gospel to them, I would not go into the McDonald's and stand up by the table and say, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 2 with a loud voice, with my big voice. My wife says I don't have a little voice, but nonetheless, that's beside the point. So I wouldn't do it that way. I would sit down at the table and I would very quietly share the word of God but I would preach the gospel to them. You say, without big gestures and without big voice, how could that be preaching? Because what makes preaching preaching is what Peter is doing in verse 14. It is proclaiming the message with boldness, with authority, and then calling the people to action. And whether you do it in a, a big setting like this with a big voice or in a very soft setting at McDonald's, it is the message of authority. Thus saith the king, God has commanded men everywhere to repent. What gives you the right to go to your neighbor or family member and give them the gospel? You have been commanded to do it by the king. It's the king's commission. It's the king's message. And if you're going to be a loyal subject, you have got to make preaching a priority. You say, Brother Stephen, I'm a woman. I'm not a preacher. Did you know this word Caruso in the New Testament is used to pulpit ministry, but also one-on-one -on -one evangelism? And every one of us here are to be involved in preaching the gospel to our neighbors and family. That is the force of the message. But then the second thing we want to see tonight, and I can't believe that clock is going as fast as it is, it is the focus of the message. This is the word kerugma. There are two Greek words translated commonly in the New Testament to preach or preach. It is keruso, to proclaim as a herald. That's what we've been talking about, how we give the message with boldness, with authority, God's authority. But secondly, the kerugma is translated preach, and it refers to the content. So what is the content? What is Peter actually preaching here? It gives us the understanding of what the gospel is. Well, there are four points in Peter's message here. To understand them, let's go back and talk about what is happening here. It is the day of Pentecost. The sound of rushing mighty wind, cloven tongues of fire, people gathering. What does this mean? And notice Peter stands up and he begins to preach. And in verse 16, he says... This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. Now, when Peter says it's the last days, every Jew that heard him that day would have done like this. They would have taken note. It would have perked their interest. Okay? Why? Because the Jewish people were zealots. That means they were zealous, for Messiah to come and to establish his earthly kingdom, which would be a Jewish rule of the world. The mentality of the Jewish people was Messiah is going to come, he's going to overthrow Rome, he's going to establish an earthly kingdom over which the Jews will rule everybody else. That's exactly what the disciples were expecting. You remember after 
Christ, that last year of his ministry in the Gospels, he would be teaching them about his coming death, and the disciples were arguing about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. James and John even had their mother go to Christ and ask him if they could sit on his right hand and left hand. They were expecting at that time an earthly kingdom. So in the Old Testament, when the prophets in the Old Testament used the phrase last days, that referred to the coming of Messiah the first time. The Jews understood that. That's what the prophet Joel was preaching about, the coming of Messiah in the last days. Now, we understand that because after the resurrection, when Paul, as a Jew, talks about the last days, he's talking about the coming of Messiah, not the first time, but the second time. And so we're living in the last days, and we're waiting for Messiah to come, so we're anticipating. So these Jewish zealots, when Peter said, this is about the last days, they would have said, Messiah must have come. Where is our Messiah? They would have been very excited. And Peter is going to tell them in this gospel message that 50 days ago you murdered your Messiah. And they're not going to believe that. So what Peter does in this passage in presenting the gospel is he lays out very careful of them a convincing, we might even call it a legal argument as to why Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that they should repent and receive him. Now folks, that is exactly where we are today in America. You go to anybody in this community, people have heard about Jesus but they don't believe that he's what Peter says he is, and they don't believe what we're going to be talking about tonight. So your sharing the gospel with them is a spirit-empowered attempt to humanly present to them the biblical truths of who Jesus is and why they should repent and receive him. It's exactly what Peter was doing on the day of Pentecost. So this is the kerygma. This is the content. This is what is called the gospel. Now, why is this really important for us? Because there's a lot of false teaching about what the gospel is. As I mentioned this morning in my testimony, I was saved at the age of 10 through a vacation Bible school. Uh, it was in a Southern Baptist church. I, I came up through my teen years as a Southern Baptist. I went to a new evangelical Christian camp. And we had a group of people there, Campus Crusade, a new evangelical group, and they taught us four spiritual laws for witnessing. Sounded good to me. The first of the four spiritual laws was this. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. The only problem I had is I couldn't find that in the gospel. I couldn't find it in the Bible. As a matter of fact, what I found out is though God does love you, if you don't repent and believe the gospel, he doesn't have a very good plan for you. It's called hell. So there was a lot of, in those days when I was growing up, a lot of wishy-washy talk about the gospel. And the same is true today. You know, pastor, I go into a lot of churches and I pick up tracks in the track rack. And it's amazing how many of those tracks are just little sicky sweet comments about you ought to love Jesus. And it really doesn't give the gospel many times. So we need to be a people, if we have winged feet, we've got to know what our message is. So what is the gospel? Number one, he presents the deity of Christ. Look at verse 22. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. He begins by saying that every one of you saw what Jesus, the miracle worker, did. And what God was doing through that, you saw it, he was approved in your eyes, what God was doing was demonstrating the deity of his son being fully God. You say, Brother Stedman, where do you see that? It's in this phrase, by miracles and wonders and signs. That threefold statement does not refer to three different types of miracles. It refers to what Christ did, how the people responded, and what God's intent was in those miracles being done. So what are miracles? Miracles are when Christ lays aside the laws of his creation and he does something that we understand to be miraculous. He raises the dead, he calms the sea, he heals the eyes of the blind. That's a miracle. The word wonders refers to the response of the people. They wondered at it. They marveled at it. They were amazed. They said, isn't this wonderful? We've never seen anything like it. 
But then Peter said those miracles that you wondered at were actually signs. Signs of what? Demonstration that Jesus is God. So Peter is pointing out to them, and they would have understood this, that I am saying to you that the one that you put on the cross 50 days ago proved that he is God. And folks, that is where we must begin with the gospel. Because can I say it, if, if we say to people, Jesus loves you, and he was just a man who lived 2,000 years ago, frankly, who cares? He was just a man who lived 2,000 years ago. He said he loved everybody. But if he is God, it makes all the difference. You know, the Lord Jesus said concerning the belief in his deity, he said to those Pharisees one day, standing up boldly preaching, he said, if ye believe not that I am, and that phrase I am refers to Jehovah's name, that I am God. If ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sin. And then John, in his first shorter epistle, said that if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, you are not of God. What is he saying? If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you're not saved. You know, it's possible for you to be a young person or even an adult, and you've come to the Baptist church, and you've heard that Jesus loves you, and you pray to prayer, and you've baptized and joined the church, but in your soul, you're not convinced that he is God. Maybe you think, like the Gnostics, that he was some kind of angelic emanation or something. Or you, like the Mormons, you think he was the brother of Jesus or something. If you don't believe that he is God, you're not saved. It's the foundation of the gospel. And so we begin with who Jesus is, the fact that he's God. Number two, Peter preached the death of Christ, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now let's remember the context. Peter is talking to these people and he's telling them that they crucified their Messiah who was God in human flesh. And the Jewish person is going to be thinking, though it's not articulated here, but they're going to be thinking, if he was God, why did he let us kill him? Well, the reason we know that that's what they're thinking, because those are the very words they uttered at the cross in reproach to him. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. So now they're going to think in their mind, if you are God, why did you let us kill you? And Peter's going to say to them that he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. What does that mean? It means that in eternity past, at some place, God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit determined there would be no other way of redemption except the shedding of the blood of the innocent Lamb of God who would become a man for us, the God-man. It was determined that Jesus had to die. There was no other way that, uh, for our salvation. As a matter of fact, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? In the mind of God, it was determined before this world was founded that Jesus was going to come to die. It's God's plan of salvation, the death of Christ. Now, you say, well then, those people that killed Jesus on the cross, they were just simple tools of God. They were innocent. No, notice the balance here between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. It says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, that's divine sovereignty, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. That's human responsibility. You say, I don't understand that. Welcome to the club. But it's true. So what it's saying is the death of Christ. We say, well, Brother Stedman, I, I don't see a lot here about sin and about the blood atonement. When we come to the end of this section, and we don't have time to develop it tonight, uh, Luke, the writer, human writer of the book of Acts says, and with many other words, Peter exhorted them. So Peter no doubt said other things. So, so what are the key issues relating to the death of Christ, which he's preaching? Well, first of all, that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. What is sin? The very nature of sin, the fact that we are sinners and we're lost and we need a Savior. The doctrine of substitution. God made him to be sin for us. He knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The great doctrines of the death of Christ for our sins according to the scripture. 
Remember what Paul said the gospel was in 1 Corinthians 15? How that Christ, by the way, that's Messiah, that's God, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. So the first two points, the deity of Christ and the death of Christ. Number three, we see the resurrection of Christ. Verses 24 through 32, we see, "...whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held of it." And then we have a section quoting from Psalm 16 relating to the prophet David, who was also the King David. And David foretells of Messiah's resurrection from the dead. And then he comes down to verse uh, 31. He, seeing this before, speaking of David, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, that would be in the realm of the dead, neither his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses." So David preached the resurrection of Christ. So the people should have known it, but they didn't. And Peter is now preaching the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ is the greatest proof that our salvation was bought and paid for. It is the greatest proof of the deity of Christ. He came forth from the grave bodily and conquered our sin and our death and our hell. I had a guy give me a track recently. He said, hey, I wrote this track. I think it's a really great track. You know where he left Jesus? Hanging on a cross. There was no resurrection. And what did Paul say? If Christ is not risen from the dead, we are of all men most miserable, and we are yet in our sins. Folks, we cannot end the gospel with Jesus hanging on the cross. The good news is he rose bodily from the dead the third day. He's alive, and that makes all the difference. So we've got to preach the resurrection of Christ. And Peter preaches it boldly. Then number four, you say there's more than the deity and the death and the resurrection of Christ. Yes, the exaltation of Christ. Look at verse 36. Peter says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. In other words, what you're seeing, this evidence of Pentecost, is the fulfillment of the promise that Christ would die and be raised bodily from the dead. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom he hath crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now what does that mean? He talks about David prophesying about a throne and the enemy being the footstool. This phrase, Lord and Christ, is a Jewish phrase which refers to Christ being exalted to the place of being the supreme judge of the universe. So God the Father made, the word made there doesn't mean created, it means placed in the position of God the Father because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When Christ ascended up to the Father, God the Father placed Jesus Christ on the throne of the universe as both Lord and Christ. You say, Brother Stedman, how do you know that? Because Paul said something very similar. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus has been exalted as the supreme judge of the universe. He is Lord and Christ. That's part of the gospel, folks. Now let me make an application and we'll close with this. I want you to do something. I want you to look into my eyes, okay? Uh, My eyes are blue, if you can see them. Uh, They're Scotch-Irish eyes. They're human eyes. Did you know, seated at the right hand of the Father tonight, on the throne of heaven, is a man in a glorified human body, and that man is also God. And he has Jewish eyes. His name is Jesus, and he's been made the supreme judge of the universe. According to Josephus, the average Jewish male at the time of Jesus was five feet tall, about like this. 
He would have had probably dark hair, maybe red hair because David was ruddy. We don't know and he was the son of David. But probably dark hair and a beard and black eyes. Now, we don't know that that's what he looks like now because something happened. You remember when he got his glorified body or he was raised from the dead. For example, when he was in the garden and Mary Magdalene, who'd been with him for three years, didn't recognize him until he spoke to her, there was something different about the body of Jesus after his resurrection. Okay? Now, we understand that because when I get my resurrected new body, I won't be wearing these glasses. I, I'll have hair again. And it'll probably be dark hair again. I used to be very dark brown in my hair, okay? I won't have any crow's feet. I won't be what I am now. I'll be different. And so Jesus is different than the five-foot-tall Jewish male that he looked like when he walked on the earth. So we don't know a lot about him. The book of Revelation tells us some things about his whiteness of his hair and his beard. But it says something about him, that his eyes are as a flame of fire. And someday, every person on this planet who has ever lived will be face to face with a Jewish man who is seated on the throne of glory, and he's God, and he is the supreme judge of the universe. And every person on this planet will look into his eyes, and those eyes will see and know everything about that person. You know, if we're saved, that will be especially terrible, Paul said, at something called the judgment seat of Christ. When we stand before him and we give an account for all of our service, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we have swift feet, we persuade men. If you're saved, you'll appear before him at the judgment seat of Christ and he will judge you, not for your salvation, but for your service. Okay. If you're lost tonight and you continue in that lost state, and you die and go to hell, you'll be raised out of hell to stand before him at a place called the Great White Throne Judgment. And there your life will be judged by him, and you'll be condemned by your own works, and you'll be cast into the lake of fire. He is absolute supreme judge of the universe. Now why do I say that's important? It's part of the gospel Peter preached. And if you analyze 1 Corinthians 15, Paul did not lead Jesus uh, just raised from the dead. He ascended up to glory at the right hand of the Father. And why does that make a difference? Because every person you and I see every day will someday look face to face at Jesus Christ into those eyes that are, are as a flame of fire. And there's nothing more sobering than that. You know, Pastor, I've had people say to me, you know, Brother Stedman, when are you going to get with a program and and change your music and all these things and get with the contemporary program. I say, you know, life's too short. And there is a day coming when I will stand before the king, the judge. You know, I had another person say to me one time, Brother Stedman, you know, we need to make the gospel relevant. You know, that is actually blasphemy. To think that we as puny human beings can do anything to make the gospel relevant is absolutely foolish. There is nothing more relevant to every person who's ever lived than the fact that Jesus is God and that he came and he died for our sins and he rose from the dead and he's been exalted at the right hand of the Father and he's the supreme judge of every person for eternity. There's nothing more relevant than that. So what are we to do? We're just go and boldly proclaim the message. So we've got to get the Caruso right. We've got to preach. We've got to have the authority of the message under the power of the Spirit. We've got to go and preach the gospel, but it's got to be a biblical gospel. It's got to be about the, the, the deity of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection, and the exaltation of Christ. Folks, we can't make it sicky sweet for the sake of not offending people. This is an eternal issue that we're dealing with. So it is the gospel. Well, we close with what the people said. And I want to encourage you by this, the effect of the message. We don't have time to develop this. <clears throat> Our time is way gone. Peter said he's been made Lord in Christ, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. They needed to have a radical change of heart and mind and turn to the Lord in faith. But the thing I want to mention in closing, notice how this happened. They were pricked in the heart. 
That word pricked is a Greek word which means they were stabbed. You know who did the stabbing? The Holy Spirit. You and I cannot save anybody. It is the Holy Spirit of God who has to do the convicting and the wooing and the drawing. The burden is not upon us to save anyone. The burden is upon us to be faithful in the power of the Spirit to deliver a biblical gospel and to plead with people. But God is the one who has to stab the heart. I'm so glad it's not left up to me. I'm glad I don't have to take lessons on how to win friends and influence people in order to bear the burden of somebody going to heaven. But I do bear the burden of being a faithful messenger with winged feet. So let me ask you tonight, how are you doing with your Caruso? Are you boldly going as a herald of the gospel to tell that good news? And how are you doing with the kerygma? Are you giving a biblical gospel that talks about the deity, the death, the resurrection, and the exaltation of Christ? We need to be doing both of them if we would have winged feet. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, it's gone way too quickly. We pray, O God, that you would help us to understand these truths and, Lord, to go beyond them and to study further about how we can be effective with winged feet in taking a biblical message of the gospel. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here tonight who's unsaved, that they would repent and believe the gospel and be saved. Lord, they've heard it tonight. Draw them, we pray, by your Holy Spirit to yourself. And Lord, I pray for each believer here tonight that we would have a fresh motivation to understand our accountability to the King of kings and Lord of lords in this matter of obedience in taking the gospel. And Lord, we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, the pastor is going to come in just a moment. But I would ask you, have you been born again? Can you say boldly and confidently in your heart, I believe Jesus is God, that he died for me, and that he rose from the dead, and he's been exalted, and he is my Lord and Savior And I have repented and put my trust in him. I am fully resting my soul, my eternity upon him. I have received Christ as my Savior. I know that I've been born again. If you can say that, would you lift up your hand? All right, thank you. If you could not raise your hand, if you could not say that, dear friend, you need to come and let someone show you from the Bible further how you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. We are burdened for your soul tonight. Will you believe and receive him, Pastor? Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts now. As believers, may we boldly declare the truth of the gospel with winged feet. May we present the content of the gospel completely. May we not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Lord, if there's one here tonight without the Savior... I pray that your spirit would have freedom to work in their heart and that they would respond to the gospel. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.